I'm uh, Michael Dumanis. I'm the director of the Poetry Center and uh, an assistant professor here at Cleveland State. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's reading. Uh, first, if your cell phones are on, based on prior experience, I think it's a good idea to turn them off. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that this year's reading series has one more reading, which is on Thursday, November 19th at 7.30 p.m. And that's uh, three poets published by Cleveland State, um, Helena Mesa, Matthias Svalina, and Allison Titus. And uh, their books will be just out for this reading, and I hope you can join us. Today we have two terrific poets reading, um, Kevin Prufer and David Baker. I'll tell you their biographies, and uh, Kevin Prufer will read first, followed by David, followed by a brief Q&A if any of you have questions for either writer, and there are books to my left, and there's a table that are happy to sign those books at to my right. Kevin Prufer, a Cleveland native, is the author of four books of poetry, most recently National Anthem, Four Way, 2008, which was named one of the five best poetry books of the year by Publishers Weekly and Book of the Year by Virginia Quarterly Review. He's also the author of Fallen from a Chariot, Carnegie Mellon, 2005, and the editor of the anthology New European Poets, Grey Wolf, 2008, and of Pleiades, A Journal of New Writing. His work appears in such journals as American Poetry Review, Boston Review, Penguin <coughs> Review, The New Republic, The Washington Post, two editions of Best American Poetry, and three editions of the Pushcart Prize Anthology. He teaches at Central Missouri University and lives in Warrensburg, Missouri. David Baker is the author of eight books of poetry, most recently Never Ending Birds, that came out this year with Norton, and Midwest Eclogue, as well as three critical books. His poems and essays have appeared widely in such magazines as The Atlantic Monthly, The Nation, The New Republic, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Poetry, Slate, The Yale Review, and more than a hundred others. He has received fellowships and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Poetry Society of America, and the Ohio Arts Council. Formerly a professor at Kenyon College, the University of Michigan, and Ohio State, David Baker is currently professor of English and Thomas B. Fordham Chair of Creative Writing at Denison University, and a faculty member of the Warren Wilson College MFA program and poetry editor of the Kenyon Review. Please help me welcome Kevin Prufer. Thanks, uh, Michael. It's a, it's a really a pleasure to be reading it in Cleveland where I grew up and uh, with David Baker whose um, poems I've really admired for a very long time. It's kind of exciting. Um, I'm going to begin by reading a poem I didn't write um, by the poet Dunstan Thompson, um, who is a, uh, a World War II poet whose work has been out of print since uh, World War II ended. <laughs> so now's your chance um, to hear Dunstan Thompson, um, a gay World War II vet um, whose, whose work I've been researching for a long time. I'm just going to read one little sonnet he wrote. It's called, This Loneliness for You is Like the Wound. This loneliness for you is like the wound that keeps the soldier patient in his bed, smiling to soothe the general on his round of visits to the somehow not yet dead, who, after he has pinned a cross above the bullet-bearing heart when told that this is one who held the hill, bends down to give folly a diffident, embarrassed kiss. But once that meddled moment passes, oh, disaster charging on the fever chart wins the last battle, takes the heights, and he succumbs before his reinforcements start. Yet now, when death is not a metaphor, who dares to say that love is like a war? It's a great poet, and if you can ever find a book by Dunstan Thompson, you should buy it. Um, <laughs> They're hard to find. You could, they're so hard to find you could buy it and sell it on eBay for double. Um, 
<laughs> I'm going to read from uh, my, my newest book, which is called National Anthem. Um, and then my next book, which is coming out in 2012 or something, um, called Little Paper Sacrifice. And then a little bit from this book I'm, I'm working on right now, which is called Obedience. I think I'll start with the poems from Little Paper Sacrifice. This is called In a Beautiful Country. A good way to fall in love is to turn off the headlights and drive very fast down dark roads. Another way to fall in love is to say they are only mints and swallow them with a strong drink. <laughs> then it is autumn in the body. Your hands are cold. Then it is winter and we are still at war. The gold-haired girl is singing into your ear about how we live in a beautiful country. Snow sifts from the clouds into your drink. It doesn't matter about the war. A good way to fall in love is to close up the garage and turn the engine on. Then down you'll fall through lovely mists as a body might fall early one morning from a high window into love. Love the broken glass. Love the scissors and the water basin. A good way to fall is with a rope to catch you. A good way is with something to drink to help you march forward. The gold-haired girl says, don't worry about the armies. Says, we live in a time full of love. You're thinking about this too much. Slow down. Nothing bad can happen. I think this book, which I wrote mostly in the last um, few years, is, is sort of full of war. I was going to call it the little book of bombs, because so many bombs go off in this book, and, um, and my editor didn't like that title, and um, said people might think it was some kind of guidebook, you know, or something. Um, this is called Behind the Barracks After the War. It's got a lot of God in it, too. God said, quit your crying. God said, I stopped the planes, I closed the base, I turned out the lights, what else do you want? And down from the mountain, not smoke, but a delicate wind, the likes of which we only half remembered. And God said, I saved some cities, I doused their flames. And God said, I waved away the smoke so you could breathe. And on their delicate necks, new flowers swayed in the post-war breeze, so the field smelled sweet and strange. And here is a hand grenade, God said, hollow, harmless, here is a Remington M24, bolt action, also empty. And it's true the fields stopped burning after a while. And it's true he had enormous arms. And you live in a free country, he kept saying, invisible behind the apple tree's burst of petals. At ease, he said. Here is your mortar. Take it home and keep it. Here is your night fighter. Here is your interceptor. Take them to your wives. Here is your gas mask. Here is your repulsion device. Here is your pulse bomb, your smart bomb, your brain bomb. Give them to your children, they're useless now. And then the wind kicked up, and then it was late, a cool and lovely evening after the war. The field behind the barracks exploding with lightning bugs, my duffel by my side. I was going home at last, and what's wrong with you, God said from high above the rooftop. Cheer up. This one's called Love Poem. I'll make you a bomb. <laughs> First the booster gas canister, then the heat shield, then the radium case, which, yes, is shaped like a peanut. I'll make you a bomb. First the heat field, then the lenses that drive the implosion, and last the radiation space, which, yes, is shaped like a peanut. I'll make you a bomb, first the space filler, then the glass lenses, which careful may implode. I'll make you a swan, first a crease here, then a crease there, a quick tuck for the wings and explosion of flight. I'll make you a swan, one, two, three folds, just like that, and now it's done, but it will not fly, its wingtips burning like fuses. I'll make you a dress, don't you love me? A nip and a tuck and three pens to hold it tight. I'll make 
make you a little white dress. Inside it, your heart says bang, 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 your mind like a swan's. Careful, it's shaped like a peanut. Careful of when it decays. Careful it may implode. Don't you love me? Look what I've made you. <laughs> I feel like I should just keep on reading the war poems. Do I have any more? <laughs> Oh, here's one. It's called God Bless Our Troops. It's from this new book. Um, well, maybe I won't read that. I think it's too mean. <laughs> I'll read this one called On Mercy. Knowing he was soon to be executed, the condemned man asked if first he might please have something to drink, if first he might be drunk. So the soldiers brought him a drink, and because there was no hurry, another, and one for each of them too, and soon they were all very drunk, and this was merciful, because the man couldn't understand when they put him to the wall and shot him. I'll marry the man who can prove this happened, the dying leaves said in their descent. I'll marry the one who looks through that window, the waiting grass tips said. But the sun went on with its golden rays like a zealous child, and the camera-eyed bees jittered mercifully in the distant branches. The man slept on the floor, and the little mouse in his head also slept. The soldiers didn't know who should drag him away or where they would hide him, so they laughed nervously, and one offered the body a drink, ha ha, a toast, then left him by the rich lady's liquor cabinet, where she'd find him when she came home from the hills. I'll marry the girl who kisses the lips and brings a breath to them, the starving horses said from their fields. I'll marry the man who pounds the chest and starts the heart, the caved-in houses said. And the window let the light in until the sun failed in the branches, and like mercy, darkness smothered the town. Later in the story, her grown son wrapped him in a parachute and dumped him in a neighbor's yard. Later, the neighbor who understood bad luck dragged the man to another's lawn. And so he traveled yard to yard to the edge of town where at last he slept by a little traveled road in a merciful ditch while bombers unzipped the sky. And when the town burned, he missed it. And when the treetops bloomed and charred, he missed it. I'll marry the man, the grass tips said in the hot wind. I'll marry the girl, the horses said, running from their burning barn aflame, their bodies glowing bluely in the dusk. And no one proved it happened, which was merciful for us all. The road forgotten, the man gone to root and weed to marrow and tooth and if it had happened who would find his jawbone in the loam who would pick out his bullet shells and fillings like glitter in the new wood and if a man should bring string them like words on a golden chain and make from them a charm and give them to his wife wouldn't that be mercy too This one's not about the war. This poem's called National Anthem, and it takes place at a shopping mall outside of, um, on Highway 50 where I live in rural, Can in rural Missouri on the way to Kansas, almost to the Kansas border, a little shopping mall. It's called National Anthem. And the shopping center said, give me, give me. And the moon, turning on its pole, said, I love you, you who have so much to give. And you said, darling, if you could just wait in the car for 10 minutes, and I'll be right out. And the sliding doors opened for you like a coat, and the car ticked like the contented in the catatonic snow, and the black boys at the bus stop laughed in their hoods until a bus dragged them through the night and away. And a woman paced beneath the store. And sometimes I can hear the nation speak through the accumulation of the suburbs, Olive Garden and Exxon, Bed, Bath, and Beyond, the stars that throw their dimes around us all until the eyes say love and the street says yes and the parking lot fills with angels blowing past the lines of freezing cars. You had been inside for longer than you said. 
and when you re-emerged, I went to help you with your bags. I'm sorry, sorry, into the cold air, I couldn't help, and what was the body but a vessel, and what were the stores but another larger vessel? The keys sang in my numb fingers, the flag applauded in the wind, and then I saw that you were smiling up at it. This one's about the same highlight. <laughs> it hits um, Kansas City, and then it turns south, uh, kind of, um, changes number two. I guess it's not the same highway. But, um, oh, hell yeah, it is. It turns south and goes all the way to Wichita. Um, and this, this poem takes place on the way to Wichita, um, where my brother used to live. So I used to go down there sometimes. It's a horrible city. <laughs> It's called, We Wanted to Find America. We wanted to find America through the gasps of snow that fell like last century's angels. And the starving horses, their shanks brittled over with ice. And the moon atop its brilliant derrick and the poor burning so beautifully in the oil fields. As we drove, their cries lit the winds with wailing, and you said, this isn't America, into the truck's dark cab and turned the radio loud. Super 8, Waffle House, Motel 6, the half-lit parking lots off the exit where we pulled the truck and said we'd sleep. Despite the gray-faced man unmoving by the payphone, despite the child asleep in the ice machine, and I closed my eyes so the theater lights dimmed and my skull became a screen, and on it you were rich and happy. You were saying that you loved me. And all night long the nation reconstituted itself, so by dawn the light played its ringed fingers over the dashboard and said, wake up, fellow Americans, wake up and see what I have made for you. Texaco, BP, Mobile, and the road dusted over with jewels and snow. You were so cold and beautiful, your hair undone, so we drove and drove, and I said we'd see America. The afternoon long as a bridal train, the horses falling in the oil fields. And as we pulled into Wichita, the snow grew thick and clotted on the windshield, sleet falling like frozen pilots, their legs shattering in the crowded streets, hypodermic snow, pharmaceutical and sterile, and the office towers rose above us, their lights blinking like overstimulated cells. And you said, darling, park the car. And you said, let's walk and look at the lights, how beautiful the lights are, holding my hand in front of the Dillards, the great chandelier that filled the room with shards that filled the street with blades, the chandelier like a perfect mind, and the office towers bending down to us as if they'd cup us in their hands and warm us, as if they'd lift us from the streets before we froze. I think I'll read, I'll read one more from National Anthem, and then I'll read a little bit from Obedience, this book I'm working on that I have never read poems from before. So it'll be like an experiment. This is a poem called The Enormous Parachute, and it's, it's got little sections in it that are letters that this imaginary character is writing to somebody. Um, and I guess the conceit of the poem is that one day this guy wakes up, and this parachute bigger than St. Louis, or whatever city it takes place in, I have thought St. Louis, but it doesn't matter, um, has fallen down all over the city, so there's no way out. So he's underneath this parachute that's bigger than St. Louis, or New York. The Enormous Parachute. The parachute fell over the suburb, draping the houses with nylon and rope. And where were you? Far away and half asleep. A letter. Dear X. The nylon is so lovely on a warm fall night when the breezes fill it. In the porch light's glow, it takes on that gentle blush of your cheek, and I want to rise and touch it, or wrap myself in it. The birds make scratching sounds where the cords have caught their legs. Otherwise, it's very quiet here, and I miss the stars. And you. Love, K. On the third night, I walked from my house to find that place where the nylon ended. I followed a single cord stretched down the street and over a rooftop. 
In some regions, the parachute draped so low I had to duck or hold the nylon up with my fingertips. Elsewhere, it wagged high above me, suspended from gables or treetops. Always I thought of you, asleep on the sofa in your robe, the TV on, the quiet house beyond the parachute. I camped beside an empty swimming pool and watched the parachute shimmer over the street lamps. Days the sun filled it, spreading the light evenly over the neighborhood. In time, I became accustomed to that. The parachute glowing pink each morning, then white hot by afternoon. Dear X, remember how I first kissed you in the parking lot? The hush that fell over us when at last I released you. The parachute is like that, but lasts longer. A dog approached me warily today, growled, then when I held out my hand, licked it. He accompanies me now. We eat scraps from the refrigerators of those who fled in time, and we sleep sometimes in their beds. Love. Frost came early, then sleep, drumming its fingers on the fabric. Where the parachute tore, icicles formed, hanging dangerously over the streets. Some were enormous and lovely, cascading along the parachute's gullies and runnels. Others more delicate, hundreds lighting the seams. When the temperature rose the next morning, I heard them crashing into the streets. Early winter light from holes torn in the fabric like long fingers. I followed the cord, but could not find the end. Dear X, sometimes I despair of ever discovering the parachute's edge or of returning to you. It sags and heaves in the wind. When there's rain, I drink from the runoff that spouts from the holes. Were you here, I'd show you that place where I climbed through a hole and saw the parachute stretched for miles, dune-like, snow-like, tinting over the trees and houses so beautiful I know you'd agree and terrible. Migrating birds unable to find sustenance to, or a branch to rest on die over the parachute. At night, I dream of you, sunlight, sometimes the shore, yours, K. And then one winter day, I found not the edge of the parachute, but that place where the cords came together at its center. The length I'd followed lifting suddenly into the air where it tangled in the high trees with a starburst of others. The dog panted beside me, then barked, and far above our heads, suspended from a harness, a dead man swung. Dear X, we buried the man at that point below the center of his parachute and made of his rucksack a crude memorial. I did not have any books, so recited a bit from a hymnal I found moldering on a church floor. Then, unsatisfied, I read to him from this account. You have no doubt moved on by now. For my part, I will rest here in the shelter of the parachute and the steeple's shadow until spring. called Recent History, and um, I'm just going to read two more poems, this one and one other. This is called Recent History, and I wrote it for my friend Rachel, who was putting together a website about Obama, and she wanted a hundred American poets to each write a poem about Obama, you know, because he'd won. And, um, <laughs> so I sent this poem to her that I quickly wrote, and she rejected it, because she said it was about Bush, <laughs> and I just couldn't get my head out of that shitty. Uh, um, so I had to write another one about Obama, which I won't read. I'm going to read the one that she told me was about Bush. It's called Recent History. It's about a guy on a diving board. He didn't notice that they drained the pool. The song of power mowers, the thrum of bees, the delicate necks of flowers. He didn't notice that they drained the pool, and up he climbed a little drunk and waved to us from the topmost rung. There was a war on, but it was far away. A breath of newspapers in the summer winds. We called to him and waved our arms. He didn't notice as evening approached its half-dark breezes, grass-scented and queer. Then he waved back, smiling. There was a war on, and he wore blue shorts and a funny hat, standing at the high dive's lip like it was a show. 
The bees accosting the quickly closing flowers, a gasp of papers, the power mower's spinning blade. No, we cried, and don't. He laughed and waved his arms, feigned drunk. He'd had too much to drink, and so had we. At the bottoms of our glasses, little slugs of ice. Then he bounced once and rose into the evening air, where for the loveliest moment, at the top of his arc, and we often retold this as the war went forward, he finally noticed the empty pool and startled seemed to understand the source of our objections. <laughs> she was totally right. Um, this is the last poem I'm going to read. It's, um, it's got a very spooky little girl in it, and it's the first time I've read this poem, so if I flub it, that's why. It's only like a week old. Um, it's called Churches. In 1981, in a hotel gift shop outside Phoenix, Arizona, a little girl stood by the postcard rack, smurfs, turning it gently. It creaked. She considered a picture of the desert, then looked around for her mother, who was elsewhere. She gave the rack a firm push so it spun gently on its axle, smiled, pushed it again and the postcard rack wobbled on spindly legs, and soon she had it spinning so quickly the cards made long blurry streaks in their rotation, gasps of blue for sky, yellow for sand, and then faster the girl slapping at it with her hand, grinning at me. And then a single postcard rose from the rack, spun in the air, and landed at my feet, turning in the air, while the girl laughed, and her oblivious mother at the other end of the store bought a map or a box of fudge, and then the air was full of pictures, all of them shouting, Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix twirling and falling until the empty postcard rack groaned once more, tipped and crashed through the window. There ought to be a word that suggests how we're balanced on the very tip of history and behind us everything speeds irretrievably away. It's called impermanence, the little girl said, looking at the mess of postcards on the floor. It's called transience, she said, gently touching the broken window. It's called dying, she said. It was 1981, and the clerk ran from behind the counter, stood before us. The girl smiled sweetly. The postcard rack glittered in the sun and broken glass. He turned to me, and my face grew hot. I couldn't help it. I was blushing. In 2009, my father lay in a hospital bed, gesturing sweepingly with his hands. What are you doing? I asked him. I'm building a church, he said. You're making a church, I said. Can't you see, he said. He seemed to be patting something in the air, sculpting something, a roof that floated above him. The hospital room was quiet and white. What kind of a church is it? I'm not finished. Is it a church you remember? God damn it, he said. Can't you see I'm busy? It was 1988, and I stood in line for my diploma, and my father took a picture which I've lost now. 1984, and there we are, around a campfire I can't remember. It was 2002, and his cells began to divide wrongly, first one deep in the wrist bone, then another turned hot and strange, deformed, humpbacked, and fissured, queer and off-kilter, one after the other, though no one would know it for years. It's called dying, the girl said, while the postcard suspended in the air like a thousand days. I reached out to touch one, then another, and all at once they fell to the floor. Then the manager said I was paying for the window. Where were my parents, and who was going to pay if I didn't know where my parents were? And the girl smiled from behind the keychains, and her mother pursed her lips at the far end of the store. The window had a hole in it through which a dry breeze came. The postcards shifted on the floor. Years later, my father was still making a church with his hands. They do that, the nurse said, patting his head like he was a little boy. He was concentrating on his church, though, his hands shaping first what I took to be the apse, then fluttering gently down the transepts. He sighed heavily, frustrated, began again. Can I bring you anything else? No, I said, thanks. Are you sure? She watched him tile the roof, watched his fingers shape another arch. And then it was much later. He'd fallen asleep. Outside, snow covered up the cars. It's called forgetting, the girl said, while the manager watched me, and I blushed, until there's nothing left. And a breeze entered through the hole in the window, and then you're out of time, she said, and shrugged. 
Some of the carts were face up on the floor, two burrows climbing a craggy slope, the Grand Canyon like a mouth carved in the earth, a night-lit tower like a needle. I was sweating now, but I couldn't speak. And then I was running from the shop, running past the fountains and the check-in desk, down the tiled hall to the pool where my father lay on a plastic beach chair reading a book about churches. Sunlight flecked his chest. His hair was wet from swimming. What's the trouble, he said. First his cells were thick and soupy, clotted and aghast, and then they were spinning through the air. And it was 1986, and rain drummed on the roof, for it was snowing years later in Cleveland, his hands working the air while the nurses stood in the doorway and sighed. Wind and sun, a bright day, a lovely day to lie by the hotel pool and read about how men spent lifetimes building them and never saw them finished. Thank you very much.